Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and remember, the context is everything media network. Founder and CEO John Michael is here to read you chapter 13 of a world history textbook, cover to cover. Chapter 13 is the spread of civilizations in East Asia from 500 to 1650. Let's get into it, why don't we? China, East Asia, that's China, right? <clears throat> Section one of chapter 13. We have crossed the border into the 300s, the page 300s of this textbook, which means that we are getting closer to completing this book. We're about, what? A little less than a third of the way through. Setting the scene, two golden ages of China. Two golden ages of China setting the scene. Many people in China had reason to distrust Empress Wu Zhao. From humble beginnings, she had risen to a position of influence with the emperor. After his death, she had ruthlessly taken power to her own, into her own hands, unseating her own son from the throne. She had even declared herself Son of Heaven, the age-old title of China's emperors. No other woman had ever dared do such a thing. Now, rival princes and Confucian scholars were raising the banner of revolt against her. The poet Lo Bin Wang wrote a declaration condemning the empress as a vile character who had usurped or illegally taken over the throne. Rise, rise, all men. Lo Bin Wang wrote, Consider the orphans of our day. Oh. Lo Bin Wang wrote, Consider the orphans of our emperor are left helpless and defenseless while their fathers gave what? Consider the orphans of our emperor are left helpless and defenseless while their father's grave is hardly dry. I understand that they're using a quote in the middle of a sentence, but it doesn't fit. I'm going to read it again just to really drive through that. It doesn't read right. Lo Bin Wang wrote, Consider the orphans of our emperor are left helpless and defenseless while their father's grave is hardly dry. Maybe Chinese doesn't translate great. When the empress saw the declaration, she demanded to know who wrote it. But surprisingly, she did not direct her anger to Lo Bin Wang. Rather, she berated her own ministers for failing to bring such a talented writer into her service. Like other educated Chinese, Wu prized a skilled and brilliant writer, no matter what she was on, what side she was on. Oh, she prized a skilled and whatever. In the late 600s, Wu Zhao became the only woman to rule China in her own name. Her strong rule helped guide China through one of the most brilliant periods, at a time when Europe was fragmented into many small feudal kingdoms, China remained unified under two powerful dynasties, the Tang and the Song. Heading number one, the Brilliant Tang. After the Han Dynasty collapsed in 220, China remained divided for nearly 400 years. Yet China escaped the decay this, that disrupted Western Europe after the fall of Rome. Farm production expanded and technology slowly improved. 
Buddhism spread while learning and arts continued. Even Chinese cities survived. Although invaders stormed northern China, they often adopted Chinese civilization rather than demolished it. Meanwhile, various dynasties rose and fell in the south. During the brief Sui dynasty from 598 to 618, Emperor Sui Wendi reunited the north and the south, but China was not restored to its earlier glory until the emergence of the Tang dynasty in 618. If I'm being honest, I haven't been listening to what I've been reading. Building an empire. The brilliant Tang dynasty. Building an empire. 618 AD. Building an empire, Tang dynasty. The first Tang emperor, Li Yan Yuan, Li Yuan, was a general under the Sui dynasty. When the Sui began to crumble, his ambitious 16-year-old son, si, uh, Li Ximini, Li Ximin, urged him to lead a revolt. Father and son crushed all rivals and established the Tang dynasty. Eight years later, Li Ximin compelled his aging father to step down and mounted the throne himself, taking the name Tang Taizong. Brilliant general, government reformer, historian, and master of calligraphy brush, Tang Taizong would become China's most admired emperor. Later, Tang rulers carried emperor empire building to a new height, conquering territories deep into Central Asia. Chinese armies forced the neighboring lands of Vietnam, Tibet, and Korea to become tributary states. This is, while these states remained independent, their rulers had to acknowledge Chinese supremacy and send regular tribute to the Tang Emperor. At the same time, students from, the, from Korea and Japan traveled to the Tang capital to learn about Chinese government, law, and arts. I have something written on my hand. That is a note about setting my alarm clock um, with a, a certain order to it. I can go into it if you ask. The Brilliant Tang Dynasty, Government and Economy Tang rulers, such as Empress Wu Zhao, helped restore the Han system of uniform government throughout China. They rebuilt bureaucracy and enlarged the civil service system to recruit talented officials trained in Confucian philosophy. They also set up a schools to prepare male students for exams and develop flexible new law code. Tang emperors instituted a system of land reform, that is, they broke up large agricultural holdings and redistributed the land to peasants. This policy strengthened the central government by weakening the power of large landowners. This also increased government revenues since the peasants who farmed their own land would be able to pay taxes. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Under the Tang, a system of canals encouraged internal trade and transportation. The Grand Canal linked Huang He uh, to the Yangtze River. As the result, food grown in the south could be shipped to the capital in the north. At the same time, the Grand Canal was the longest waterway ever dug by human labor. Decline of the brilliant Tang Dynasty. 
Like earlier dynasties, the Tang eventually weakened. Later Tang emperors lost territories in Central Asia to the Arabs. Corruption, high taxes, drought, famine, and rebellions all contributed to the downward swing of the dynastic cycle. In 907, a rebel general overthrew the last Tang emperor. This time, however, the chaos following the collapse of a dynasty did not last long. So I guess, what is it, 1618 to, 19, uh, to 907? 1618 to, or 618 to 907. Tang Dynasty, is that what I'm getting here? Why don't they just put that in parentheses? Tang Dynasty, this to then. Leaving the guesswork, what is this? I thought we were supposed to be efficient. Prosperity under the song. New heading. In 960, a scholarly general reunited much of China and formed the Song Dynasty. The Song ruled 319 years. Slightly longer than the Tang. However, the Song controlled less territory than the Tang. In addition, the Song faced constant threat of invaders in the north in the early... Okay. In the early 1100s, Sorry, I gotta put my sticky notes. I forgot to do that. Um, there, let's put it here. And uh, let's do the thing about the crops and the canal. I wrote notes in the description in every video that is about a section. If it's a chapter review, I do not write notes. But I use these sticky notes so as to alleviate the rereading process um, when I'm writing the notes because it takes me about a half hour. And that is not an effective use of time. So if I use this, it takes me about 20 minutes to write the notes, which is better. That's why I just stopped and used the sticky notes. I'm going to start from the beginning of the heading. Prosperity under the song. In 960, a scholarly general reunited much of China and founded the Song Dynasty. The Song ruled for 319 years, slightly longer than the Tang. However, the Song controlled less territory than the Tang. In addition, the Song faced a constant threat of invaders in the north. In the early 1100s, a battered Song retreated south to the Huanghe, where the so uh, southern Song controlled to... Uh, continued to rule for another 150 years. Despite military setbacks, the Song period was a golden age. Chinese wealth and culture dominated East Asia, even when the armies did not. Under the Song, the Chinese economy expanded. The center of farming shifted from wheat, from the wheat fields in the north to the right, rice paddies of the Yangtze in the south. New strains of rice improved irrigation methods, which helped peasants produce two rice crops a year. The rice in productivity created surpluses, allowing more people to pursue commerce, learning, or the arts. Under both the Tang and Song, foreign trade flourished. Merchants arrived from India, Persia, and Arabia. Chinese merchants carried goods to Southeast Asia in exchange for spices and special woods. Special woods. W-O-O-D-S, that's right. Song porcelain has been found far away in East Asia to improve trade. Song porcelain has been found as far away as East Asia. To improve trade, the government issued paper money. China, uh, Chinese cities, which had been mainly centers of government, now prospered as centers of trade. Chinese society. New heading. Under the Tang and Song, China was a well-ordered society. 
At its head was the emperor, whose court was filled with aristocratic families. The court supervised a huge bureaucracy from which officials fanned out to every part of China. Aside from the court, China's two main social classes were gentry and the peasantry. Gentry, subheading. Gentry. Most scholar officials in the court came from the gentry, or wealthy land-owning class. They alone could afford to spend years studying the Confucian classics in order to pass the grueling civil service exam. When not in government service, the gentry often served in the provinces as allies of the emperor's officials. The Song scholar gentry valued learning more than physical labor. They supported a revival of Confucian thought. New schools of Confucian philosophers emphasized social order based on duty, rank, and proper behavior. Although corruption and greed existed among the civil servants, the ideal Confucian official was a wise, virtuous scholar who knew how to ensure harmony in society. Peasants. Most Chinese were peasants who worked the land living on what they produced. Drought and famine were constant threats, but new tools and crops did improve the lives of many peasants. To add to their income, some families produced handicrafts such as baskets or embroidery. They carried these products to nearby market towns to sell or trade for salt, tea, or iron tools. Peasants lived in small, self, largely self-sufficient villages that managed their own affairs. Heaven is high, noted one Chinese saying, and the emperor far away. Peasants relied on one another rather than government. When the disputes arose, the village leaders and, or council of elders put pressure on the parties to resolve the problem. Only if such efforts failed did villagers take the disputes to the emperor's country or county representative. In China, even peasants could move up in society through education and government service. If a bright peasant boy received an education and passed the civil service examinations, both he and his family rose in status. That's nice. Enough about the peasantry. Let's talk about the merchants. Merchants. In market towns and cities, some merchants acquired vast wealth. Still, according to Confucian tradition, merchants had an even lower social status than peasants because their riches came from the labor of others. An ambitious merchant, therefore, might buy land and educate at least one son to enter the ranks of the scholar gentry. The Confucian attitude towards merchants affected economic policy. Some rulers favored commerce but sought to control it. They often restricted who, uh, where foreign merchants could live and even limited the activities of private traders. Still, Chinese trade flourished during Song times. Status of women. Status of women. Women had higher status in the Tang and early Song times than they did later. Within the home, women were called upon to run family affairs. Wives and mothers-in-law had great authority managing servants and family finances. Still, families valued boys more highly than girls. When a young woman was married, she completely became part of her husband's family. She could not keep her own dowry 
and could never remarry. Women's subordinate position was reinforced in late Song times when the custom of foot binding emerged. The custom probably began at the imperial court but later spread to lower classes. The feet of young girls were bound with long stri uh, strips of cloth producing lily-shaped foot pattern about half the size of a foot that was allowed to grow normally. Tiny feet and stilted walk became a symbol of nobility and beauty. Foot binding was extremely painful, yet the custom survived in times to uh, in, end in time spread to lower classes. Even peasants' parents feared that they could f not find a husband for their daughter with large feet. Not all girls in China had their feet bound. Peasants who needed their daughters to work in the fields did not accept the practice, yet most women did have to submit to foot binding. Women with both feet often could not walk. With, women with bound feet could often not walk without help. Thus, foot binding reinforced the Confucian tradition that women should remain inside the home. I wonder if that's true. How bizarre. Foot binding is really a brutal, brutal, brutal practice. And like the feet look like this. But the bottom of the feet look like that. Which is the worst part. Arts and literature of the Tang and song, new heading, arts and literature of the Tang and song. A prosperous economy supported a rich culture of the Tang and song China. The splendid palaces of the emperors were long ago destroyed, but many paintings, sta paintings statues, temples, and ceramics have survived. Landscaping paint or landscape paintings. Along with poetry, painting and calligraphy were essential skills for scholar gentry. In both of these crafts, artists sought to balance the harmony through a mastery of simple strokes and lines. The Song period saw triumph in Chinese landscape painting. Steeped in Taoist tradition, painters sought to capture the spiritual essence of the natural world. When you are painting, when you are planning to paint, instructed a song artist, you must always create a harmonious relationship between heaven and earth. Misty mountains and Delicate bamboo forests dominated Chinese landscapes. Yet, Chinese painters also produced realistic, vivid portraits of emperors or vividly lively scenes of city life. Other arts. Buddhist themes dominated sculpture and influenced Chinese architecture. The Indian stupa evolved into graceful Chinese pagoda a multi-storied temple with eaves that curved at the corners. I don't know what an eave is, E-A-V-E-S. Eaves that curved up at the corners. Chinese sculptors created striking statues of the Buddha. These statues created such a strong impression that today, many pictures of the Buddha are as the Chinese god rather than the Indian holy man. The Chinese perfected skills in making porcelain, a shiny, hard pottery that was prized in the as the finest in the world. They developed beautiful glazed, decorated vases uh, for tea services and other objects that Westerners would later call chinaware. Artists also produced porcelain figures of nighing camels, elegant court ladies playing polo, and bearded foreigners fresh from their travels on the Silk Road. A flood of literature, and this is the end of the section, a flood of literature. Thank you for joining us.
Thanks for joining me. Leave a coin in the comment below as a help to the algorithm. A coin. There's like a quarter emoji. Please. A flood of literature. Prose and poetry flowed from the brushes of Tang and songwriters. Scholars produced works on philosophy, religion, and history. Short stories that often blinded fantasy, romance, and adventure made their first appearance in Chinese literature. Still, among the gentry, poetry was the most respected form of Chinese literature. Confucian scholars were expected to master the uh, skills of poetry. We know the names of 200 major and 400 minor Tang and Song poets. Their works touched the Buddhist, Taoist themes. as well as on social issues. Many poems reflected the shortness of life and the immunity of the universe, immensity of the universe. Probably the greatest Tang poet was Li Bao, a zestful lover of life and freedom. He spent most of his life moving from place to place. He wrote some 2,000 poems celebrating harmony with nature or lamenting the passage of time. A popular legend says that Li Bao drain, uh, drowned when he tried to embrace the reflection of the moon on the lake. Li Bao drowned when he tried to embrace the reflection of the moon on the lake. That's poetry. More realistic than less romant more realistic and less romantic were the poems of Li Bao's friend Du Fu. His verses describe the horrors of war and condemned the lavishness of the court. A later poet, Li Qing Zhao, described the experience of women left behind when a lover goes off to war. Her poems reflected a time when invasion threatened to bring the brilliant Song Dynasty to an end. And on that note, I will bring this video to an end. I hope you have a wonderful day, and goodbye.